It is a different day two weeks later from the first recording, but we are back now to talk about music. So I'm going to go through um, albums released in alphabetical order by album title. The first one that I had listed was Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction, which includes Welcome to the Jungle, Paradise City, and Sweet Child of Mine. So I think Guns N' Roses, in the same sort of vein as Van Halen, is really a vehicle for an extraordinary guitarist who like it could just shred everything to pieces and the rest of it i could take or leave i've never really been a fan in general like across the board of really that style of rock like the showier style of rock but also um just specifically guns and roses partially because of axel rose's voice i just it's yeah it's screamy it's a specific, it does a thing. <laughs> you know, we all know what it does. It does a thing that people thought was probably cool at the time. Wait. What is weird to me is when Axl Rose tries to sing a ballad and I'm like, what is happening here? This isn't interesting or fun or nice. Like um, November Rain. Like, I'm like, are you really the right person for this job? <laughs> I actually really dig uh, Guns N' Roses yeah. for the most part. Um, I totally get that hair bands aren't people's thing and mostly they aren't mine. I will say that like in my mother's household, it's sacrilege not to like Journey. So, I mean, <laughs> keep your Journey. And also Journey isn't quite the same as the other hair bands. Like there's some Camera. sort of, yeah. Uh, I mean, Guns N' Roses, I would say is a hair band straight oh, up. Oh, totally. But, um, I kind of like it. Like, I kind of like his, that his voice is screamy and like, don't get me wrong. I'm not in my, sitting in my home, like Guns N' Roses is not my work music or my exercise music or anything, but it's also not, when it comes on the radio, I don't really turn it off. You know yeah, what I mean? It's driving with the windows down music. Yeah. I also think that Guns N' Roses is one of those groups that was just really, really like specifically for its time and very niche as far as like this late, 80s hair band sort of life of its own so anybody who was like in middle school or high school around the late 80s is probably all about it and that's because they grew up with it but it, it doesn't really stand the test of time yes they were incredibly niche but they were incredibly niche in a very successful way and oh yeah hugely popular <laughs> the thing about hair metal in general is that it it was like a subculture like that's what like wayne's world is about that's what spinal tap is about but then um it's also was incredibly like it was very mainstream and very popular you know so i think you have that sort of dichotomy of like we're rebels we're you know counterculture or whatever but like also like we're all making millions and millions of dollars on our hit records <laughs> yeah. yeah it's it's kind of funny to like look at the other huge types of music that were popular in 87 which we'll get into more but it's like a lot of the rest of it is electronic pop and punk and those feel like their reactions against hair bands hair bands feel like a culmination of rock they, like it's a direct line from Elvis to Guns N' Roses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, through Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd. There's also like something about 1980s rock and roll that I find frustrating because to me, rock at its essence is transgressive. And I see nothing transgressive in hair bands. I see transgressive in 70s rock and roll like Led Zeppelin and the bands you were naming. I see it in 90s rock, like the grunge bands we just named, but I don't see anything, for lack of a better term, I don't mean this musically, but punk about 1980s rock. Like it all feels very conformist actually to me. Like when people say that like, you know, oh, these hair bands were all about androgyny. And I'm like, David Bowie was over on stage left doing his thing. Like you can't yeah. beat that. I'm sorry, you're not, 
No. Glam rock was about androgyny. Hair bands well, were sort of yeah. the big point that I was going to make is hair bands are incredibly white. Well, and also they were transgressive and subversive in a very mainstream way, which was that, you know, you put a naked woman on the cover of your album. You have a music video with, you know, with all these lewd things happening, you know, and and it was really, it was a lot of, about sex and it was very misogynistic. Um, you know, there's lots of jokes about that in Spinal Tap. Hair metal, it's not about, you know, this cultural sort of sticking it to the man kind of thing, but it is, I think something that it doesn't get credit for is like the musical virtuosity in a lot of it. Um, it, it might not be compositionally that interesting, but like, I mean, going back to Guns N' Roses, like, Sweet Child of Mine, the things that Slash does with a guitar on that track are um, pretty incredible. Next thing is uh, sort of a sore point because it's uh, an excellent album by someone who was an excellent musician, but is someone that I kind of feel awkward listening to now. Michael Jackson, Bad. This album includes Bad, The Way You Make Me Feel, Man in the Mirror, and Smooth Criminal, all excellent songs. I think we all feel really like conflicted about Michael Jackson, right? And what I keep coming back to is that like you just cannot deny the groove. <laughs> and it sucks because um he really hurt people. You there's no apologizing for that. But I do want to talk about the music because if we go back to 1987 and and though, you know, if you think about how songs remain in the sort of cultural consciousness usually for three or four or five years after they're first released i mean some of those songs bad uh smooth criminal these songs i felt like were always in the background of when i think of my early childhood like kindergarten first grade second grade like that was the soundtrack <laughs> yeah they're really good songs by a monster I think I've told all of you this before, but when it comes to Michael Jackson um, and many other musicians and artists and creators like Michael Jackson, I will let myself enjoy it if I hear it on the radio or something like that. I'm never going to choose to turn it on, especially if other people are around, because yeah. you don't know which of, you know, the friends at my Halloween party were, you know, themselves molested or something like that. And yeah. in some way, playing Thriller at your Halloween party is like tacitly saying, I'm this okay, okay with this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and this, this is something that I've more recently come to in the past couple of years, but I, that's just how I, I feel about it. And like, I'm not here to tell anyone watching or listening to this that they are not allowed to like Michael Jackson. This is just how I personally feel. The reason we have so much difficulty talking about Michael Jackson and his contributions to music now is because he did a terrible thing and a lot of people are not up to the discomfort of having to decide that, like having to let go of a, such a prolific artist who created all these great songs that, like Molly said, is the soundtrack to many of our lives. And they don't want to face that discomfort of, should I remove this man from my listening enjoyment no so they're gonna like we can't change the past and that's that's the easier argument to make so unfortunately there's no like that we can talk about it but there's no there's no easy solution to it i feel that discomfort strongly because i really do believe that he's the greatest pop star ever probably and mu musically technically very sound very important yeah. to pop culture i don't think it was anita sarkeesian who initially said this but she talks about in one of her videos the line in the sand approach as one way to deal with artwork created by problematic individuals. And I like that approach. And it, the basic tenet is that you draw a line in the sand of their creative works where like anything that it came before whatever the, the, the problem is, you still deem acceptable for yourself and anything after it no longer is. I also think it's important to remember that while we live in a culture that venerates celebrities, right, these musical works we're talking about weren't just Michael Jackson. Like, yes, he did a lot of the work. He was a songwriter too, but he wasn't the only songwriter on that album if you look at the notes. He wasn't the only person dancing in those music videos. He wasn't even directing all of those music videos. And I, tr I say this because I also think about the Cosby show when we talk about this stuff, right? Yes. Bill Cosby was also a monster. 
Uh, he still is, he's still alive. Um, but we also have Felicia Rashad mm -hmm. on the Cosby Show, right? Like a, a titan of, of feminism and black womanhood and like all these great things. And so that show wasn't just Bill Cosby either. The point that I want to make that's related is that like each person individually has to draw their own lines wherever they feel mm -hmm. right doing so. And we can't tell anyone that they're doing it in the wrong place. Right. It's not our place. Right. We can't jump down people's throats and become like hyper vigilant about it. Like, oh, you, you listened to Thriller. You're basically molesting children. You know what I mean? Like, and we laugh. But we all know people like this, right? Uh -huh. We've all witnessed interactions like this. And I think to Erica's earlier point about wanting to distance yourself from that discomfort, I feel like sometimes in these conversations, people get that way out of a, a need to prove themselves, right? Like, I am so not a child molester that I won't <laughs> even be in the same room as someone who says Michael Jackson's name, right? And like, <laughs> like, and I think it's this misguided attempt to right the wrongs of the past. And the truth is the past is the past. And the reason why our therapists all tell us not to think about it too much is because we can't change it. Heart, Bad Animals, which has Alone on it, which is, I have a friend who um, occasionally runs karaoke and that's one of the two songs that no one's allowed to sing at karaoke, Alone. Probably because no one can do it. <laughs> what, what an incredible voice. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of heart, like musically. I'm not that into it. I, I kind of find it kind of corny. But um, I know, I I know that you love heart. <laughs> but you cannot deny that singing. I mean, that voice. Jesus, like it's so. Uh, like who can do that? REM document, which has <laughs> it's the end of the world as we know it, and the one I love on it. I talk about Michael Jackson as the soundtrack of my youth, and that was like out in public spaces. But with my dad at home or in his car, it was Ariane <laughs> and Elvis Costello. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know that I have anything to say about the end of the world as we know it that anybody hasn't already said. George Michael, Faith, which has Faith, Father Figure, and I Want Your Sex on it. This is like right at the turning point when people are like about to realize that he's gay. Because I also remember that like the father figure had like people read some gay innuendo there, which I mean, because it it's kind of there. Um, also, probably the worst of the songs you just listed, but great music. Uh, Faith is a great song. And also is... my childhood crush. Belinda Carlisle, Heaven on Earth, which has Heaven is a Place on Earth. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, many of us just did the same gesture <laughs> of affection. I unabashedly love this song and I turn it up whenever it's on on the radio. I think this song is sort of, not only this song, but it's one of the like starters. It's in the starter pack of what we today call bubblegum pop. Like bubblegum pop existed in different ver variations earlier than this, but this was like the mold, I think, that bubblegum pop would later in fit into. Yes, exactly. Yeah. They're also part of the starter pack. So it was, um, I always forget her whole name, but Mall Tiffany. You know Tiffany. what I'm talking it's about, right? Tiffany. It's just Tiffany. Just Tiffany. Okay, okay. That's why. Mall Tiffany. <laughs> she played at a lot of malls, didn't I she? I know, it was a whole yeah. thing. Okay. She was the shopping mall, <laughs> the shopping mall queen. Tiffany, comma, from the mall. <laughs> 10,000 maniacs in my tribe which has oh, what's the matter here hey jack Kerouac, like the weather and don't talk on it which are all like songs the weather about our album <laughs> i keep getting like the weather stuck in my head lately like when it's raining outside the the mtv unplugged is <sighs> by far their best album but this these songs are still good what a great voice though mm -hmm. you too the joshua tree which has where the streets have no name i still haven't found what i'm looking for and with or without you Remember when YouTube was good? They were good through the 80s and a, a, a little bit into the 90s. <laughs> okay, let's go to a place where like, you put the album on and you get that, it it starts out, it's almost like Madonna's Vogue with the like the synth strings low. And then you get that shimmering 
guitar that fades into da, 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 da. yeah and then the beat comes in <laughs> i wanna run yeah that god that song is so good so yeah. good <laughs> that's the first song on my on my cleaning house playlist it helps get nice. my energy up <laughs> yeah and it has it has that start man it has that oh uh, there's something about that <laughs> i'm sorry i'm gonna keep talking about this because it starts in this way and then it goes so hard once it starts going, you know? It kind of smacks you in the face. Well, it, it doesn't smack you in the face. It just pushes you forward. Also, Bono, talk about one of the great voices of his time. Yeah. Not to leave the other songs out because I really love With or Without You for being yes. a totally miserable, sad, depressed song that Listening to it on the surface doesn't sound that sad, yeah. but when you think about it, you're like, fuck, man. Mm -hmm. So that song always makes me think of Friends. <laughs> oh no, what a horrible reference. It plays in one of the scenes when Ross and Rachel had a fight and they're looking out their respective windows and it's raining. <laughs> but you know what, if you think about it, that song had such staying power because that was fully 10 years later. You know, that song was old at that point. I mean, maybe maybe people are, are already thinking of it in a nostalgic way. I don't think, and it doesn't read that way on the show. It really doesn't, does it? Yeah, I mean, that album was just, it felt current straight through the 90s. In Excess, Kick, mm -hmm. which has New Sensation, Devil Inside, and Need You Tonight, which is one of the sexiest songs of all time. Need you Tonight is one of the greatest pop songs ever. It's so simple. Uh -huh. There's so little going on there. I mean, it's really just a beat. To it's me, I actually find that song corny. I don't find it oh. sexy, to be honest. <laughs> the one I, person on earth that doesn't find that song sexy. It's so simple, but his performance really sells yeah. it. It's it's the understatedness of it that when he does finally say, I'm lonely, that you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that song is is just audio sex. The Cure, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, which has Just Like Heaven on it. Incredible song. Such a good song. Happy Music with Sad Lyrics is like The Cure's perfect brand. Like they did that better than anybody. <laughs> Gloria Estefan and the Miami Sound Machine, Let It Loose, which has Rhythm Is Gonna Get You and One, Two, Three, one of my personal favorites. But it has other bops on there too that are well known, like, then I do anything for you. But I love everything about this album, Miami Sound Machine, Gloria Estefan. Like, I feel the way about her that I feel the way about. Meryl Streep. I could watch Meryl Streep eat a shit sandwich and I would be entertained. I could listen to Gloria Stefan sing Happy Birthday and I would I would give it a Grammy. America has had moments where they've been really into Latin music. You know, it was like in the 60s, there was a thing. And then and then again, and like this is when it's coming back, you know, and there was like a La Bamba moment, I guess, but like <laughs> now, now we're into you know, salsa again, and it's becoming huge. And then it goes away, and then it comes back with, you know, the Jennifer Lopez, Selena movie. What Ricky Martin and Enrique Iglesias and that mm -hmm. whole, yeah. yeah. it was the whole thing. Suzanne Vega's album, Solitude Standing, which has Tom's yes. Diner and on it. You gotta give Suzanne Vega credit, because at least that album wasn't really like most of what other people were doing. I do think Luca is a legitimately good song. It's a little bit like understated. I wish there were just like a little bit more like flavor to it or something. Um, Tom's Diner is not my favorite song. <laughs> I kind of love it because it's like turning blandness into art. Like it's, yeah, because if you listen to the lyrics, it's slice of life, yeah. right? That's the genre. Like it's just like, hey, we're just here. And that's kind of what I mean when I say that she was doing something others weren't because in the era of excess, this song is antithetical to the concept of excess. <laughs> Linda Ronstadt, Emmy Lou Harris, and Dolly, Dolly Parton's trio, but we've already discussed that at length, so we don't really need to continue that conversation here. 
Rick Astley, whenever you need somebody, which of course includes oh never going to give you up. Can we just like recrawl this whole video right now? <laughs> so I, I watched an interesting TV documentary about the recording industry, and they talked about how this song was actually like a huge step forward in recording quality and recording technique. He did not sing Never Gonna and Give You Up in the same take. He, there, were, there were two separate takes, and the, and it, it wow. sort of like one take was just never gonna, never gonna, and the that other one, yeah. And the other take was give you up, let you down, and and they did that. So it overlaps a little bit and it flows in a certain way. But also, no, but wait, did they say why they did that, Michael? Yeah, vocally, it's tough to go back and forth between the two. Yeah, uh, from from like the chattier, faster notes to hitting a good higher note. Um, yeah, I know, but that's never stopped anybody before. <laughs> yeah, but they could do that. They have the technology to do that seamlessly now, and they didn't really b before this. Well, and then what happens when you're translating it to a live performance? He probably did it all live then, and probably because they were talking about how like he they thought he was more likely to flub the faster, lower stuff, just because like those notes they wanted them to be really precise each mm -hmm. one that he hit. Will um, somebody please explain Rick rolling to me? I've never understood the term. You try to make somebody listen to the song when they maybe don't want to and don't realize that that's what they're about to, what that's what about to happen to them. Yeah, you oh. just delete link in. It's like, oh yeah, I read this interesting article and you send them a link and it's to the song or something like that. Like, okay. I, I, I sort of don't get why they chose that song. It was just dumb. <laughs> I mean, it's not a great song, but it's not a terrible song either. <laughs> I think it's a fun song. I think it's yeah. just, it's it's another bubblegum fluff, even before Rick Rolling. No one was standing around going, you know, who's a genius singer songwriter who really stirs the deeper nuanced emotions in me is Rick Astley. Like <laughs> nobody is, you know, cause I think sometimes when people create ph phenomenons like Rick Rolling or they diss bubblegum pop, they're coming at it from that perspective. Like, oh, why do people like Taylor Swift? She's garbage. I much prefer the Beatles. No one is fucking comparing Taylor Swift to the Beatles. Let people yeah. have their fun. I, I actually, I, I agree with you, Ramin, because I take a lot of issue with like, and you know, it, it, it even goes into these generational debates. They don't make music like they used to. Well, nobody's trying to compare boys to men with the temptations nobody's trying to compare you know 80s rap versus like 2010s rap or hip-hop or any any of these genres you can't really line them up right next to each other and each thing has its place rick astley has his place in 80s and 90s pop history and i think most of the songs that do get to be a hit are there for a reason sometimes they're also only there for a season but they make it there for ah. some some reason how much of a place does he actually have? Because he he was a one-hit wonder, right? Like, it was just the one song. And the one-hit like, wonders are very critical to every top 40 list. I mean, yeah. I mean, look, we all we stand a one-hit wonder. The last album is one of the best on this list because it's Whitney Houston's Whitney, which has I Want to Dance with Somebody, Didn't We Almost Have It All, So Emotional, and Where Do Broken Hearts Go? <laughs> In listening through this album, she sounds so much more secure and like they had the time and she had the budget to have time in the studio to get the better takes than on her yeah. previous album the thing that i always say especially about so emotional imagine you're whitney houston's backup singer and you have to sing so emotional live in concert oh my God. those incredibly high belted notes it is so high like that song is so high like and, and the color, the dark color of Whitney's voice makes it, it tricks you. You're like, that's not that high. I can sing along with karaoke. And like, no, honey. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, I Want to Dance with Somebody is incredible. Mm -hmm. um, Didn't We Almost Have It All and Where Do Broken Hearts Go are not as good, but they're still good. <laughs> oh, I love Didn't We Almost Have It All in a like torch song way. Like, just So do I. So that's the last of the albums that I had up on the list. But there are a handful of other songs that I wanted to talk about and a, a couple other little things. So other significant songs, Barcelona by Freddie Mercury and Montserrat Caballé. Oh, this is another one that I found in my adulthood when I was studying 
vocal music. I was crying. My jaw was hanging so low on the floor. And if I'm honest with myself, it was probably the first time I had intentionally listened to Montserrat Caballé. Like I was young. I didn't fully appreciate Freddie Mercury at the time. It sort of elevated my appreciation for both of these artists to hear them together because it's so, it's so good. And it's one of these random pairings that nobody would have thought of until it actually happened. And then it's like, of course they're singing together. I love though, that there's two kinds of people who listen to this song, people who are in on the joke and I include both artists in that. Yes. And people who are not in on the joke and think of it as like high fucking art just because it has caballé in it. <laughs> Those are the people who like Andrea Bocelli, dear. They can, you know. There, no, there's also some classical singers in there too, though, right? Like those voice teachers in college who are like, my art form is relevant. Yes, we need to make this legitimate. I am looking at the Wikipedia page for Barcelona by Montserrat Caballé and Freddie Mercury. Mercury had been a longtime fan of opera, yeah. especially favoring Montserrat Caballé. In 1986, he mentioned on Spanish television that he would be glad to see her in person. And they had a friendly initial meeting in Barcelona in February 1987. Later, when the city had been chosen for the 1992 Summer Olympics, Caballé, a native of the city, was asked to help with producing a song for the games. She summoned Mercury for the task. That's so perfect. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know that. I love it. I heard an NPR story recently that was trying to scientifically find out why people liked Fred, Freddie Mercury's voice so much. It was the most bullshit scientific study. Um, the conclusion they came to is that he has really unpredictable rates to his vibrato. Sometimes it's slower, sometimes it's faster. I'm like, that is not why people like Freddie Mercury. <laughs> if that were why, I'd have a bunch of freshman sopranos for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but then Cavalle, maybe the best pianissimi of all time. Uh -huh. The way that she can like float it and then just keep it floating, like just like endless breath, endless. Other great songs, uh, the Bangles cover of Hazy Shade of Winter, which is a Paul Simon song. Tiffany comma from the mall, I think we're alone now, <laughs> was 87. Aww, I like that song. Yeah. I like the original better. But... Yeah. I'm with, I'm cool with this version too. Also this year, Bill Medley and Jennifer Warren's I've Had the Time of My Life, which is oh our karaoke go-to. <laughs> we did a karaoke duet, didn't we? Oh my God, it was so good. I don't care who you think actually, whose name you just said actually sings this song or whatever. It's actually by Jennifer Grey and Patrick Swayze. I don't know why you think <laughs> it's someone else. In classical music, John Cage wrote As Slow As Possible. Oh, that's an interesting one. There's an earlier version, which is for piano, which I've heard live, uh, which was written in 85. But the organ version was written in 87. The score is only eight minutes long. Sorry, eight pages long. But there, uh, there are performances that have ranged from 20 to 70 minutes long. And there's that one that's going to, when it's done, have a 639 year duration to it. Oh, is that the one that's like in a museum or something somewhere? A it's sound in installation? A, it's in a little church in Germany. Yeah. Playing on their organ. Um, and like tourists will travel there to go hear it. Yeah. 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 John Cage is, I think, one of the most interesting composers of all time. And like people talk about his music as just being like a joke, like 433. But like, mm -hmm. if you really get into what he meant by 433 and stuff like mm -hmm. that, it's really good. One thing that I take a lot from his music is how much freedom he gives the performers for something like as slow as possible. That is the tempo marking. You can do it in 20 minutes or you can do it in 24 hours, which there are performances of a single performer doing it for 24 hours. Which is um, awesome. Yeah. yeah. What do you want to say with your art? Here's a it's... simple blueprint to, to allow you to experiment. Yeah, I used to be a little bit snarky about it, but since I have spent some time in the art world and around performance art and sound installation and that kind of thing, I, I think I have a much, a much more appreciation for how uh, really moving that kind of thing can be. And I, you know, I would love to be in, in that little church in Germany that is playing a 690 something year performance of as slow as possible like that. Like, could you imagine just sitting there for like an hour and letting it wash over you? If you're there for an hour, you 
likely will be there for silence. Um, you can look on their Wikipedia about this piece and like it'll say like there is silence from this year to this year. Oh my god. <laughs> and then this chord is held for this long, for this these many years. <laughs> so yeah. Wow. Also in 87 in classical music, Nixon in China by John Adams. The whole opera I don't love, but as much as everyone hates um, I'm the Wife of Mao Zedong, the book, the book, the book. I just really like it. I think it's really like impressive and yeah. not just showy. It's also like musically effective. I've seen this live HG, when HGO did it like two or three years ago. It was extraordinary. It was one of the greatest artistic achievements I've ever seen on stage. And I say that as someone who has seen many an HGO show at this point, but like the level of precision, just in the chorus of diction that they had to achieve with these English words and these rapid fire repeated texts is mind boggling and astounding. And there's the whole time I was watching this production, just this like, feeling of impending dread like of of knowing what this history meant for both sides as someone who despite the fact that i like opera struggles usually to sit through an opera i was on the edge of my seat the whole time so there are three musicals that i thought were important to talk about that came out in 87 into the woods les miserables and starlight express so Into the Woods, I love Into the Woods, but it's not my favorite Sondheim score to listen to. But in the context of watching a performance, it's so good. Like, I, I love that stage show so much. High school Michael was obsessed with Les Mis. Every high schooler was obsessed with it. <laughs> Probably still is. Not so much for me anymore. <laughs> so my thoughts have changed on Les Mis over the years. It's still not one of my favorite musicals. Um, it's still not one that I'm going to turn on when I'm in the kitchen running errands, but although it's overrated, I think it's good. And I do mean like not very good, not excellent. I think it's good. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's got a lot of good tunes in it. It hits pretty solid emotional beats. For the most part, I care about every character I'm supposed to care about. I hate every character I'm supposed to hate. Then Starlight Express, the, the roller skate and, one, the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical about people acting as trains, having a competition um, to see who can fuck the hottest train. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole thing is on roller skates, right? Yeah. Okay, who wants to play some games? Where we left the scores last time, we're gonna go through the 1987 Grammys. They include some things from 1986 because of how uh, when the Grammys fall to Molly. Which of these won Record of the Year? It's got to be either Graceland or I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Wait, but Record of the Year is a track. It's not the album. Correct. But I'm still caught between those two. Back because the Grammys have historically life. rewarded old, long-tenured artists. I feel <laughs> bad because Michael said that this was going to be easy. Easier. Michael, I'm going with Graceland, Paul Simon, final answer. You are correct. Yeah. <laughs> Which of these won Album of the Year in 87? Ooh, these are some good ones. Uh, process of Elimination, I don't think Sign of the Times, I don't think Trio, although Trio was definitely deserving. Um, uh, they're all good. Yeah. Boy, that was a year for the Grammys, huh? <laughs> I'm torn between Michael Whitney and U2. I, d I feel like it would have been Michael or Whitney, though. I don't think U2 was really established enough yet. I'm going to pick Whitney. No. Damn. Eric. Well, she should have. <laughs> Erica, what do you think? I'm gonna say bad. No. Michael Jackson. No. Molly. You guys forgot that the Grammys hate black people. Definitely back then. I'm gonna say the Joshua Tree. Yes. Am I in first place yet? You're in second. Yeah. <laughs> Eat it. Wait, so that means I'm in third. Yes. Rude. But you get the next question. Oh. Which are these one song of the year? Remind me again what the difference between song of the year and record of the year is. No fucking clue. <laughs> Nobody knows, do they? I still haven't found what I'm looking for. No. Damn. Erica. Oh, God. 
Is it somewhere out there? It is. The I knew Bible. that. <laughs> I knew it. This is a combination between Billboard and Pitchfork. Now, Pitchfork is coming at this with hindsight because they didn't exist yet. Well, going on what we've already discussed today, the first answer I'm going to give is Bad by Michael Jackson. What the fuck? What the really? fuck? Fuck. So, Are you telling me the greatest pop star of all time who has the greatest record sales more than the Beatles did not have one of the top albums in 1987 with bad? That cannot be correct. I'm mad. One. Who's mad? One. <laughs> <laughs> Rolling Stone um, put it at number 15. What? what the fuck? Pitchfork doesn't have it on their list. And we're going by albums? Yeah, it's wild. <laughs> okay, so now we're back to Ramin. I know what I want the answer to be, but it sounds like these are mostly white publications. So the Joshua Tree. Okay, the Joshua Tree is on this list, tied for ninth. So Ramin gets two points. REM document. Five points because it is number six. I'm gonna say The Cure. The Cure is on the list. But they, they were number eight, so you got three points. All right, here's the thing. My body's saying, let's go. <laughs> but the rest of that reference is from the wrong decade, so I'll stop there. <laughs> the album I want to say is a pop album. That's the thing. These lists usually don't include pop artists. But you know what? I'm going to go, I'm going to risk it anyway. Whitney. Whitney is not on the list. George Michael Faith. George Michael was not on this list. We, we was, again, pop. I was going to say that too, Erica. I'm going to say 10,000 Maniacs in no. my tribe. Appetite for Destruction by Guns N' Roses. Yes. They were in third place. That's hogwash, but okay, I'll take the points. <laughs> you got eight points. Fleetwood Mac. No. Def Leppard. No. Molly's out. This is another risk. Suzanne Vega, Solitude Standing. Mm -mm. Damn. In excess? Mm-mm. Erica's up. I'm going to say George Harrison, Cloud Nine. Mm -mm. Tied for ninth was The Replacements, Please to Meet Me. Oh, wait, this is all the ones that we said we were supposed to know, but we don't actually know, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Number seven was Lamont Young. Number five was Boogie Down Productions, Criminal Minded. Number four was Tell Bruce Springsteen, Tunnel of Love. Number two was Sonic Youth, Sister. Oh, Sonic Youth. We talked about Sonic Youth. And number one was Prince, Sign of the Times. I was going to get Sign of the Times. What do you mean? Sign of the Times of all the Prince albums? Yeah. Now for hard mode. Oh, <laughs> God. Oh, no. Is that easier or harder than Depeche mode? <laughs> this says Billboard. This is Billboard. OK, do I get to start okay. then? You do. Bad by Michael Jackson. Fuck! <laughs> Whitney. It's got to be Whitney. Come on. I want to dance with somebody, which gets Ramin how many points? Seven points. La Bamba. He's not on the list. I think we're alone now. Not on the list. I told you this was hard. <laughs> don't tell me I don't know what was on the radio in 1987. <laughs> I was four years old. Sweet child of mine? No. Huh. I've had the time of my life. Oh, of course. Actually, no. We're gonna give you up, and then we're gonna let you down. But I'm never gonna fuck all of this game. Faith by George Michael. No. It's the end of the world as we know it. Heaven is a place Fox. on earth. No. So number ten, living on a prayer. They're all older songs, aren't they? That's what I started to think after I went out. Number nine was Shakedown by Bob Seger. Number eight, The Way It Is by Bruce Hornsby and the Range. Number seven, Here I Go Again. Number six, Say La Vie by Robbie Neville, which I've never heard of. Number five, Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now by Starship. Number three was Shake You Down, not to be confused with Shakedown, but Shake You Down was the theme song for Beverly Hills Cop 2. And since Axel F from 
Beverly Hills Cop 1 did so well, they pushed this one real hard and apparently <laughs> doesn't mean people liked it. And then number two, Alone by Heart. And number one, Walk Like an Egyptian by the Bangles. Oh, for God's oh. sake. In third place with 46 points is Molly. In second place <laughs> with 55 points is Erica. In first place with 56 points is Ramin. Ramin won by a point. <laughs> Now that we've got all that down, I thought it would be interesting to sort of like, as part of our wrap up of seven, talk about what white rich men were telling us we should like in 87 with the Grammys, what white people were patting themselves on the back and saying we should like, and what the critics were saying we should like, <laughs> sometimes with hindsight. I don't know. I mean, I guess it's like, it's what you would expect. This is bringing to mind a lot of memories I had of even being very young and seeing that the Grammys and the top 40 hits on the radio, a lot of that didn't necessarily jive with what I was hearing and what we were spending our money on and what really spoke to people. I've looked up billboard lists before for particular years to make playlists, and it's like half of them I've never heard of almost consistently. But I feel like this jives with my conclusion that it's all bullshit. But what you're saying is that it's, it's what felt important to tastemakers of the time versus what has had staying power now what 30 years later again this is like record executives telling the radio stations what to play that's what makes it onto the billboard lists i don't really trust the radio because even now yeah it's for the most part rich old white people telling me what i should like <laughs> but you're also citing critical lists from pitchfork and rolling stone who i think we could both agree that we do kind of have at least a, a modicum of respect for i mean they both have problems with the just like the pure whiteness of it all and like who they let in through the gate that is does not meet that criteria the, like those lists at least show a little more of like what has had staying power i mean we can talk about how guns and roses is maybe not as meaningful to uh, us for as a group but how we you can still like you can't deny the presence of it and the impact of it and you know we probably spent more time talking about that album than anything else i'm really shocked that michael jackson was not higher up on a lot of them you know we spent a long time talking about him also but like isn't that you know thriller and bad or like the great michael jackson albums right yeah i'm i'm especially surprised that it's not on pitchfork's list because pitchfork was looking back because they didn't exist yet and like yeah. He didn't crack the top 20. He might have been elsewhere on the list. I only looked at the top 20. Also, I don't know when Pitchfork made this list. Now Pitchfork is very pop positive. They like pop. I don't know if they were when they made this list. It doesn't sound very pop positive, does it? I mean, they put Prince at number one. Yeah, but um, Prince is kind of crossover -y. Prince gets respect from everybody, you know? Rightfully so. Pitchfork did have George Michael on their list. What about you too? Was that up there on some of them? Because that feels like one that we talked about having really enduring quality until you two became a disaster later on. <laughs> so, um, they did not chart on the top 20 for Pitchfork, but they were number something. They were number seven for Rolling Stone. Oh, you know, that's why I keep talking about staying power because like, I still go like, wow, those Lady Gaga hits were like 10 years ago. Shit, you know? <laughs> like, um, because they still feel present and current to me. You know what else there's no accounting for too is the, like, especially with the ones of how often they were played on the radio, because I just pulled up Michael Jackson's Bad. It got released on August 31st, 1987. That means it took at least a week or two beyond that to get played on the radio. And then all of a sudden you've lost two thirds of the year. I would rather do a metric of, given I, you can not really do it to get one solid year for all the songs and see how they rank you couldn't do it that way it's like movies coming out timed so that they can be oscar bait yeah yeah or make the holiday like thanksgiving is a big day for movies to be in theater so for holiday rush there's you know a lot of family movies a lot mm -hmm. of easy to watch movies but that's also when a lot of the oscar bait stuff is coming out yeah because 
getting ready for January. Yeah. People want things to be fresh on their mind when it comes to award season. Which makes sense. But like the the way to combat that is like to put in criticism, I guess, but and box office numbers, but like those are also all completely skewed. Well, the thing about criticism is that it's just one guy's opinion, you know, and it might be informed through like watching however many movies or like, you know, whatever, but it's still just a guy who's like, I like this movie or not. But like in the case of Pitchfork and Rolling Stone, it's a team of people, but they're a team of people who work together and Mm -hmm. presumably have some group thing going on. Let's start to wrap this up and talk about the things we're tracing and compare them to 85 and 86. So female representation, representation for people of color and representation for LGBTQIA plus people. Does this year feel like it's a significant step in any in either direction for any of these three things? It does feel very much like it's coasting, yeah. But it does also seem to me that the ones that we've talked about today that have withstood the test of time and are and are maintaining a popular following now almost 40 years later is the stuff made by women let's you know we have gloria estefan really making a crash landing we have a not crash landing crash landing is that you know what i mean like sticking the landing yeah. there you go that's good and then and whitney houston too this is arguably one of whitney's best albums and the movies were the, are the same way like a lot of the movies that are still pop oh i love that movie it's it's the ones that are more inclusive and more uh representative of a larger group of people like and not just dancing. the white right white men might be the power behind most culture but like everybody spends money <laughs> <laughs> women are half the population you can see them starting to catch on that like movies made for women are going to do well because women want to go see movies about the things that interest them romance you know whatever i hate to think of all of us as just marketing demographics right but all of the entertainment industry is a business right and yeah. so they're going to be thinking about who is going to be spending money and so even though you have white men in power and being sort of the taste makers they can start to see like oh women are interested in this and i think as as time has gone on like now media environment is so fragmented that really there really truly is something for everybody <laughs> what, what i'm interested in, in seeing especially with movies is people making movies especially with women viewers in mind that is not just romantic comedy yeah let's make an action movie for the woman viewer like oceans eight <laughs> well i was thinking like mad max fury road oh yeah all right i need to go look up choral arrangements of rick astley so <laughs> All right. good night everybody and thanks for watching the video for anyone who is watching um I will try and cut this down so it's not three hours long. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, I love you all. Love you all, people. Daddy. Daddy.